wanted to welcome everybody to this exciting Japan Society event, which is part of our Passing the Torch series in honor and celebration of the upcoming Tokyo 2020 Olympics this summer. Uh, this is actually like the second wave of programming. The first wave of programming featured uh, a judo event, martial arts classes for kids as part of our Children's Day celebration, baseball and Paralympics films. And now this second wave is featuring sports and athletes um, and just sort of a celebration of baseball and figure skating, which are two really popular sports in both Japan and the US. And I am beyond thrilled to be able to present um, two uh, amazing people, Maya Shibutani and Alex Shibutani. They're two-time Olympic bronze medalists, US national champions, world champions, like four continents champions. I mean, I could go on and on, but not only that, they're now authors. Uh, they're food bloggers, they're huge on social media, they have a lot of interest, and they just released the second book in their Kudo Kids series um, on May 4th through Penguin Random House. Uh, the first book featured, you know, some travel in Tokyo, and it, it's geared for kids ages 8 to 12. Um, it was inspired by the Tokyo Olympics. So I couldn't think of a more perfect um, you know, program for young people uh, than to feature the Shibutanis to talk about their books, The Mystery of Manhattan and The Mystery of the Masked Medalist. So I'm not gonna stay on too long. I'd like to just introduce Maya and Alex Shibutani. Thank you, Lisa, for having us this morning. Alex and I are excited to talk about whatever questions you wanna ask and then also our book series, Kudo Kids. Yeah, thank you to Japan Society for hosting. We're, we're excited to be here. And as Lisa mentioned, uh, the first book in our series, Kudo Kids, uh, focuses on uh, Tokyo and the, the Summer Olympic Games. And our protagonists are a sibling duo, uh, somewhat similar to, to us, although they aren't skaters. They're Mika and Andy Kudo, and they travel to Japan for the first time with their parents. And, uh, you know, mystery and adventure ensues. Yeah, maybe you could talk a little bit about the two characters and are there parallels between the both of you? Obviously, the names are certainly similar and, and is it semi-autobiographical or how did you come up with the story? I would say that um, semi-autobiographical, like emphasis, heavy emphasis <laughs> on semi. Uh, yeah, the names are similar. Mika and Andy's names are both four letter first names as are Maya and Alex. Uh, and Andy is an older sibling to Mika. Um, and I, I guess I suppose there are more comparisons <laughs> that can be made between the characters and ourselves. But uh, that's what you know we decided we were comfortable with. We wanted to uh, write from experience and we've been to Japan many, many times over the years for skating competitions and shows and just for, for vacations. And so uh, we thought that it was the perfect environment to place these characters in. Uh, and what better uh, source of inspiration than some of our own travels uh, to sort of set the stage for their adventure. Especially when taking on a new challenge, which is creating a book series, Alex and I want to write about what we know. And so it was important to us that it wasn't exactly Maya and Alex transported into this story. It was amazing for us to create a new set of siblings that people could kind of befriend and follow along for their adventure. So we're known as the Shib Sibs and these are the Kudo Kids. Yeah, um, and so, you know, Maya, Maya mentioned it a little bit, but it was also important to us to create two new characters, especially living in the States and having grown up here uh, to sort of generate uh, two Asian American characters that kids could follow along with and get to experience different aspects of, of culture. Obviously book one is set in Japan, but book two takes place in New York City. And we just, when we were children, we didn't have uh, a dynamic sibling duo, fictionalized or otherwise, to sort of look up to or follow uh, and sort of see ourselves represented. And so rather than just placing us and already existing in the real world, Maya and Alex in a book form, we wanted to sort of create that next generation set of characters, sort of duplicate ourselves in a way so that there could be more representation moving forward. And I think what was so special for us is especially with book two, with COVID and everything, we've finally been able to go to bookstores and to be able to see both books together and see the covers, which has Mika and Andy Kudo on both, 
those are, it's a dream come true because we wish that when we were kids, we could have gone into a bookstore and seen covers like this. And so to think that young readers everywhere and, you know, the book, like you've mentioned, Lisa, is for readers generally age eight to 12, but we've had readers as young as five or six. And then we've had some older kids, like adults reading it. <laughs> kept our audience in mind so that everyone can enjoy the adventure. And it's one of those things that we didn't notice that we were missing necessarily. Like when you're a kid, I was happy reading all the books that I read. Uh, it's just very few of them featured Japanese American, Japanese, Asian American, Asian protagonists. Uh, and so, uh, you know, books are an amazing thing that can kind of help you see the world and gain new perspectives. And so we wanted to write this book not only for young Japanese American kids or young Asian American kids or people in other parts of the world, but uh, people who might not necessarily gain that exposure and who better to introduce them to this world than us. It's very cool. I mean, were you both like good writers growing up? Did you always want to be authors or did this somehow develop organically like during the pandemic or how did you kind of decide to do this? I wrote my first book when I was three. Wow. Uh, so this is <laughs> no, I, I mean, I'm pretty sure we wrote a few short stories. We right, both right. did creative writing. We always loved reading when we were growing up. We had big imagination. So telling stories is something that we always loved doing. Our medium has just kind of been telling stories on the ice. And so after the Olympics in 2018, when we had this opportunity to tell different stories together as a team, it was something that we wanted to jump right into. And it was something that we were hoping to be able to do at some point in our lives anyway. Uh, but, you know, the platform of the Olympic Games and our success there and people sort of not only appreciating what we were doing on the ice and the results that we were able to achieve, but I think uh, what resonated with a lot of people and has over the course of our career is our our unique sibling relationship. Uh, this bond that we've had since we started skating together at the ages of nine and 12 and how closely and how well we work together to accomplish our goals. Uh, and so I think it was only natural for people uh, to assume or to hope that we could take that same level of positive collaboration into a book writing venture. So yeah, we, we, we've enjoyed writing, we've enjoyed reading uh, since we were kids. I think that was really formative in our, in our development. Uh, but yeah, I think that all signs kind of pointed to us being able to channel some of the experiences that we've had and our skills in working together and collaborating uh, into something as special as this series. That's great. Do you want to talk a little bit more about their adventures in Tokyo and what inspired some of the places they visit? Do you have favorite places that you both like to go? I know you're also food bloggers, so maybe you have restaurants or just, you know, anything about Tokyo that kind of inspired you? Sure. So you mentioned that Mika and Andy in our first book go to Japan for the first time. And Alex said earlier, we've been going to Japan for years now. And so we definitely have a lot of experiences in different cities there. But with the Summer Olympics coming up in Tokyo, we want to take our what we knew about the Olympics from the Winter Olympics side and also have the chance to kind of do some research while also sharing the Summer Olympic sports that we've come to learn about over the years. Yeah, rather than having the entire plot premise be based on something that we were super familiar with, uh, and the potential for it to become kind of too inside baseball. Uh, or inside skating. Or inside skating. <laughs> for people who don't know that expression. Right, we, we've been very fortunate over the years to, to develop relationships and friendships with athletes and entertainers and artists and people of all Chefs. different backgrounds, yeah. right? And so not only did we want to highlight sports and, and sports figures and these different sports that people maybe weren't as familiar with, uh, and we definitely had a mind to doing that. Uh, we were able to kind of reference some of the conversations that we've had with athletes who have competed at the Summer Olympic Games uh, because we have crossed paths with many of them throughout our time sort of in the Olympic family. Uh, yeah, the, the greater yeah. Olympic family. And so uh, I think as far as travel is concerned, we wrote this book starting in 2018, uh, the fall of 2018. So not knowing at all, I and mean, no one ever knows what the future holds. But one of the things that we wanted to capture was from the very get go, the excitement that you have when you're getting ready to go on an adventure. And Mika and Andy and their parents are leaving their house. Uh, and I guess this is a, a mini spoiler, but they're leaving their house to go on this exciting summer trip that they've been looking forward to. And when you're leaving for a trip, you obviously go through all these planning stages and what do you want to bring and what time do you have to leave the house? Uh, and I thought that it was a really fun way for us to 
show Mika and Andy's personalities and set the stage for what might happen and the challenges that they might have to overcome by exhibiting that Andy uh, potentially left an important item that would play a really significant uh, role in the plot at home. Uh, and that's definitely happened to me <laughs> in our family's experience where we've been sweaty running to, to the gate to catch our flight because I, you know, we had to turn around to go back home to fix it. You've forgotten passports, ice skates, okay. costumes. <laughs> you definitely get the family dynamic down and the energy's off to a good start, so. Yeah, but I mean, I guess I kind of mentioned it and, you know, as far as once they hit the ground, uh, they they obviously hit the ground running and their, uh, their dad is a travel and food writer. And so he's able to serve to Mika and Andy, but also the young readers or slightly older young readers uh, as like an introduction to Japanese cuisine and some of the neighborhoods and things like that. And so uh, that was something we wanted to do. And there's obviously a heavy component of food. There's a chef character in book one uh, because Maya and I are very passionate about all food, but Japanese food in particular. So we wanted to, you know, include that. And the global nature of the games really does a lot because with Mika and Andy's first trip to Japan, we wanted them to really have kind of this open and fresh experience and meet people from different places because we've been very fortunate that that's been our upbringing, meeting right. people from around the world. Very so, naturally, just through competition. Yeah, kind of teaching young readers that it's great to reach out and meet people who have different experiences. Yeah, coming from completely different corners of the world, but um, understanding that you're all there for a reason. And that's been our experience. You know, we'll meet competitors and other skaters or other athletes at different events. And we can all sort of have that mutual understanding and respect that we all work hard or we're all very passionate about what we do, excited to watch and participate in sport. And for Mika and Andy, they're very excited to be in Japan for the first time. And for many of the people that they interact with, they're also in Japan for the first time experiencing something special. So that sort of shared sense of found a community that the Olympics can bring uh, as an event is really special and something that we've been able to witness and we wanted to incorporate that into the story. That's great. And what about the book that takes place in New York? Do you want to talk a little bit about the mystery in Manhattan and what inspired you in New York? And I guess the multiculturalism multi uh, here as well is inspirational and the food. <laughs> sure, when we were thinking about book two's location, New York was definitely a city that we wanted to explore. We grew up on the East Coast in Connecticut and I was actually born in New York. So it's a city okay. that we're very familiar with. And it's one of those exciting places that you realize people always kind of dream of visiting, but don't always have the chance. So for us to be able to introduce the city and all it has to offer through a book was something that was very exciting for us because you realize how much, whether it's food or culture or entertainment, that's just museums, the city has so much to offer. And that's the case with every city in the world. And so uh, even, even the town or the city that you might live in right now, uh, and what we found is as often as we've been fortunate to be able to travel and see new places, sometimes it's just taking a look around you and, and seeing things with a different perspective. Uh, and that's definitely a component as well while Mika and Andy are in New York City, uh, we try to sort of layer in that idea of uh, your point of view and your creativity because, you know, amongst many other things that they're interested in, just like us when we were kids, Mika and Andy have a bunch of developing and merging interests. And one of them happens to be photography for Mika, which she picked up uh, in Tokyo or she really honed and developed and that skill was celebrated for her there. And so we wanted to kind of push that because I think that, uh, in, in thinking about sort of the premise of this book series, like Maya mentioned, we are trying to share uh, a, a new city with, uh, with our readers um, and kind of open their minds. And if we can do a really good job of hosting them through this experience, uh, that's exactly what the aim is. But if something that we wish was in the book doesn't exist in real life, then we're more than happy to create it. <laughs> Creativity is definitely a key component to storytelling, but also um, problem solving in life. Uh, and we've had to be very creative throughout our own skating career. Uh, and as we've grown up to, you know, handle each other, uh, <laughs> solve problems as a unit, solve problems within our unit. Uh, and so, you know, while not getting too uh, reflective 
in the story, you won't see anything that you can point to necessarily and be like, oh, well, that means that Maya and Alex dealt with this exact same problem. But giving the characters their own set of unique experiences that can teach them important lessons uh, about, you know, individuality uh, and creativity because, you know. Communication, teamwork. Right. We, the, the, the biggest joy is creating something and that work inspiring young people to to read more or to write more, to draw, to create, to take photos, to see the world. Uh, that's That's been one of the beautiful things about kind of the reception of this story and these books. Yeah, maybe just to lead in a little bit, Macau were sort of like some of the challenges that you faced in your career as skaters, you know, having to work together, but kind of seeming like you're always in unison and kind of facing just difficulties in competition. How did that kind of prepare you for writing the books together and just sort of coming up with ideas for the characters to be like inspirational to young people? When it comes to how our relationship transferred over to working on the book, I think that one of our strengths is our open communication and our mutual respect for each other because at the end of the day, we both <laughs> know that whether we're creating something on the ice or whether it's something for the book, we want it to be the very best that it can be. And so if either of us has an idea, we fully listen because if we're bringing that idea up to the other person, it means that we put thought into it or have something that we think is special. And that's the... That's the thrill and chaos of the process, right? Because in skating, uh, the, the work that is presented is often, you know, months and months, sometimes years in the making because everything, not everything, but hopefully as much as possible becomes cumulative. All the skills that you develop since you're a very young person just starting out in the sport, uh, sort of compile together to create the, the programs and the performances that you hope to put out at say the Olympic games. And so uh, understanding that that process takes time because, you know, in our experience and I'll just only speak to our experience, but you can be told something that makes a lot of sense to you in the moment uh, on paper or in person. It's just, oh, like you, you need to, you, you won't understand until you've actually been through it. Uh, and then comes sort of that understanding that dawn of, oh yeah, like I thought I got it back then, but I had to sort of experience hardship or have to experience, um, you know, it in order to, to fully comprehend uh, the value of, of the lesson. And so, you know, Maya and I, uh, our experience doesn't differ too much from any other athlete or artist or person who's pursuing their craft, except for the fact that I guess it's a major difference. We were doing it with someone that we had known for almost our entire lives. And that that creates a sense of comfort, which is wonderful for so many reasons, but also uh, can be a hurdle uh, because in terms of communication and when you're growing up and you're going through adolescence and you're discovering that you're two different people, even though the world sees you as a unit, uh, being able to sort of navigate differences of opinion, different ideas, different interests, while understanding that, like, fortunately, we both always maintain that sort of North Star in terms of us being equally passionate about what we were doing. But sometimes you have two different parties, and they're equally passionate about accomplishing the goal, but have different uh, thoughts on how that goal should be accomplished. I think to the outside, people can assume, oh, since you're family, everything's always going to be on the same page, or that unison that you have on the ice, that must just be natural. But what we have found through experience is that everything takes hard work, everything takes um, effort to communicate. It's not extra intuitive to us just because we are family. Right, yeah. It's not something that we take for granted. Uh, and I think in the storytelling, uh, of Kudo Kids, we wanted to be realistic about that as well, just because this family is, is close-knit, just because these siblings get along well and, and are uh, amazing at solving mysteries and working together and they can hang out and, you know, they're, they're not fighting all the time. Uh, that doesn't mean that there aren't uh, those hurdles. And I think that something about our relationship that really is an addition to the book is the fact that it's not just from one character's perspective the entire time. Each chapter alternates between Mika and Andy. And that balance is really great for us when we're working on it. But I also think it makes for a more complete story. Yeah, we have a unique dynamic, to say the least, from the standpoint that most sports, uh, you know, figure skating is, I think, predominantly recognized as an individual sport. Uh, and obviously, Maya and I are a team, but we're a team of two. 
Uh, and in team sports, the teams tend to be rather larger. Uh, Lisa, you had mentioned baseball. In baseball, you've got nine players on the field and, you know, additional players in the dugout and in the bullpen, and they're all working together. And there's that sort of sense of community uh, and sort of fostering that collective energy to reach your goal. And the pitcher can't win the game by himself because he needs the, you know, all the batters to score runs. Uh, and it's very much distilled when it's just two people. Um, and that means there's more responsibility and more pressure on each individual person, but also our experience and our connection is kind of unique. This team is unique because it's one part male, one part female. Uh, and so we've, from a very early age, understood the importance of balance and equity in our relationship. And obviously it's not always, you know, a perfect balance. <laughs> Uh, but me being the older sibling and Andy experiences that in Pluto kids too, uh, learning to understand when to let the younger sibling like take the lead. Uh, because at a certain point you have to look at your, your teammate or your partner or your friend uh, as an equal, not just you know, based on how old you are. And this is kind of really subtle, but even when I look at the covers in front of us, we spent a lot of time with the artist thinking about every detail. And I think that that's something that skating has prepared us well for, but this is the first time I've mentioned it, but in the first book, Andy's kind of slightly in the lead when they're running down this path in Japan. And when we were working on the cover for the second book, we have Mika. They're, they're in step. They're in step, you know, but, but there's, like, a slight... there's a slight angle. Right. You know? mm -hmm. And so for the second book, it was a <laughs> specific choice for us to have Mika be in the lead for this story. So there's more balance to how they go together. Right, which I think is, um, you know, perhaps not unique anymore um, for the literary space, but the, the, the book alternates between chapters. And so you get Mika's perspective and then Andy's perspective. And so uh, being able to, to share that balance that we have in our relationship and transfer that to our readers is, is important. Yeah. Well, definitely skating is one of those sports that, you know, you make it look easy, but like the work that goes on behind the scenes, especially in ice dancing, I don't think people realize because they're like, it's just, you know, it's just dancing, they're not jumping, but like just having to do really, really deep edges and skate super close. I mean, these are like things that you make look easy that are not at all easy. Um, and I'm sure growing up, how did you even decide to go with ice dancing over pair skating? Did you ever want to be solo skaters? Maybe you want to talk a little bit about how you started skating together. So we first started skating individually at the ages of four and seven. And it wasn't until we were nine and 12 that we started ice dance. And it was after we had the opportunity to see ice dancers skate live. We were so impressed with the skating skills and the speed. And I think drawn to the more performance, creative storytelling aspect of it. I mean, we were nine and 12, so I don't think that we we're like, oh yes, that's why we want to do that. But mm -hmm. ice dance as a discipline is very complete. It's both athletic and truly creative. Yeah, and I think that figure skating as a whole gets that sort of, um, that label. It is a creative artistic sport because there's music and there are costumes and it is a performance. But what we noticed when we saw Ice Dance for the first time live in contrast to the other disciplines, and granted this was another generation of Ice Dance and the sport does change and evolve like anything else. But uh, we noticed that, you know, as a whole, the, the detail and thought process in creating some of these stories was perhaps more thorough and engaging than even the single skaters or the pairs, because like you mentioned, Lisa, they're there are jumps or in pairs, there are throws and lifts and you can watch a performance. And even at the young age that Maya and I were, we noticed that uh, there were some programs where it was jump and then skating and it happened to be the music and then another jump. Uh, and, you know, to an onlooker, someone who's maybe just turning on the TV for the, for the Olympics, it all looks artistic because there's music and other sports don't necessarily integrate that type of, um, that element to it. But with ice dance, we saw the opportunity to really um, not only improve our skating skills because the quality of the skating is so important, uh, but also sort of tap into some of the elements that drew us to the sport initially. And, you know, when Maya was skating by herself, uh, she loved skating to music. Just she'll, I don't know, CDs? Yeah, yeah CDs. CDs. <laughs> uh, that, that, it's like a, it's a disc. Uh, and there's a little hole in the center, the and it's how people—it's how people, young people, out it's there, how people yeah. used to listen to music. Before. 
Spotify and, and iTunes and stuff. But um, yeah, so that was what drew Maya in, I think, right? It was just movement. I mean, I was always a huge fan of dance when I was younger. So the ability to create something that an audience can become fully immersed in instead of always focusing on the technical, because I think with ice dance, what's amazing is that it's highly technical, but it's kind of more blended in. You never really know when it's coming. With jumps, you can kind of see the setup. For and audience. of course, like, like what like was mentioned, uh, the perfection emphasis on ice dance is is pretty heavy because uh, a fall in ice dance stands out. Any mistake that is noticeable is is a huge error. Um, whereas in in other disciplines of skating, falls can happen and they do naturally affect the score. But uh, you can see someone win a competition with a fall, uh, and that's very unlikely in ice dance. So of, of course, those weren't things that we were alert to or aware of, we just enjoyed watching it. Uh, and of course there weren't any Asian, uh, the competition that we saw, we didn't see an Asian couple, uh, an Asian ice dance team. <laughs> couple is actually an interesting word because <laughs> in skating, um, pair teams and ice dance teams are referred to as couples, right? Um, and I think that that speaks to sort of the traditional stereotype that uh, both partners are like a couple. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with the word couple. Obviously, it has like multiple meanings, like a couple <laughs> of birds or, you know, a couple of people. But uh, I think in this context in skating, it always implies romantic uh, or sort of a deeper personal connection than just, you know, a couple of birds. <laughs> um, and so Maya and I were breaking ground, I think, um, not realizing it. Because and in the very early days when we were nine and 12, I think what we realized is that we enjoyed working together on something. It was more fun for us than working separately and accomplishing small goals. We had that communication. We had, we enjoyed going on performing together. Yeah. We had, it was over time that we had to learn that there were sort of preconceived notions for what uh, a successful team looked like uh, or what a successful team's makeup was whether it be, you know, two people from different families or siblings, and then figuring out how to navigate that in a competitive landscape while staying true to ourselves uh, and the types of stories and performances that we wanted to show. Yeah, I think you've definitely broke barriers being like a sibling duo in ice dancing, which for so long was so dominated by certain countries and by certain teams. And it was kind of like the naysayers kind of saying, well, I don't know if siblings could really act out, you know, a routine to that type of music or, and I think you kind of broke through and kind of, you know, once you got you know, higher up in the sport, you were able to choose music selections that worked for you and choose costumes that worked for you. So maybe you want to talk a little bit about how you choose your music and costumes and just kind of what goes into that. And Sure. Yeah. I mean, in terms of um, all storytelling, I think that we will do going forward, um, you know, on the ice, uh, in, within the pages of a book, we've developed an understanding that we want to be global storytellers and tell universal stories that people can relate to. And that's particularly important in a sport where once you make it to the higher levels, you're competing in different countries uh, and your judging panel is comprised of people from all over the world. Uh, and so, uh, for example, you know, throughout one season, you might have to compete in France and Japan and Omaha, Nebraska. And, and those programs all ideally have to work well for the audience and the judges in those individual locations. And so um, that's something that we have always been thoughtful about. Uh, and I guess as far as understanding the, the history of the sport, you know, before us meddling at the 2018 Olympic Games, there had never been a team of Asian descent to stand on the podium, uh, much less just a team of color. Uh, on the podium at the Olympics uh, in ice dance. And so, you know, whether it's spoken or it's spoken of or not, uh, our rise through the sport and our success at the very elite level is when we won national championships. Like I was the first Asian American male to win a US national title uh, in any discipline of skating. Uh, and, you know, internationally, anytime we medaled or won a competition, it was the first time an Asian team had done so. And so being aware of our platform and sort of taking the opportunity of our success to grow the sport in different parts of the world so that it could be more inclusive or so people 
could be exposed to it and find it interesting uh, through their exposure to, to our skating was something that we thought was really important. And so I guess to distill that further, I think that what really changed over the course of our career was our ability to realize our own power and our own creative ideas because there's a rich tradition to the sport. You definitely notice that there are themes and trends and so not worrying so much about what's in and more about what you wanna create and what you'll be committed to every single day. Because for us to create the programs that we did, we didn't exactly have a map or a suggested music tracker. Okay, if we do this, it will be a guaranteed hit. We didn't have that, so that took a lot of extra thought, time, effort, and it was a bit of a risk, but I think that we really thrived under the condition of realizing that we were, we had to have a vision and it was up to us to make it come true. And as far as like following trend, we were never the trend because no one else could copy what we were doing in the exact same way because of, you know, who we are. Um, and so that sort of, that did inspire another level or us to hit another gear of creativity um, because we knew that we had to establish something, I think, unique and different, and it would be unique because we were doing it in the first place, but really push our boundaries as far as, and, and the boundaries of the sport, uh, because we were forced to. Um, and I, I think. think that once that you're in rhythm kind of within a competitive season, it's easy to just go from year to year because with one program, you're given a general theme, but for us to actually have to stop and ask ourselves why we were doing something or what we wanted to do specifically, I think that those are questions that kind of aren't always asked. You just do. Right. Not, not, yeah. <laughs> Learning to acknowledge the system and the structure that, um, points you in a certain direction, um, but questioning and sort of exploring the boundaries, uh, the margins with which you can kind of generate something that is uh, fulfilling and entertaining. And we're um, so fortunate with the collaborators and coaches that we have just because they realized that we were coming into our own as people and it became more about having a conversation because I think with a lot of skaters, you're given the task of being as physically as prepared as possible because it is a very taxing sport and discipline. But we just knew that there had to be more than us just being technically skilled and in the best shape possible. Yeah, uh, it's impossible for any team or individual in any sort of pursuit to take on everything themselves. Like, you know, behind every successful story, there are people who are helping along the way. Uh, and I think over time, uh, as tiring as it became, Maya and I, even though we had tremendous support from our coaches and our parents and our collaborators, we decided to take on more than I think the typical athlete does in our sport. Um, like Maya mentioned, as opposed to just focusing on being in good shape for our competition and uh, training hard. And we uh, get asked a lot if that added pressure. Certainly. I mean, when you're investing so much of your energy and will into making something happen, there's more pressure. But I think that we also learned to think of it as having more confidence and belief in what we were doing. Right. As opposed to doing something that you were told to do uh, or you're following the guidance because, you know, if we're cutting deep, uh, if my, if a coach told me to do something and it maybe didn't work out, um, the result didn't happen the way we wanted it to, I could internally feel sort of at ease because it's like, well, I, I listened to my coach and so we're all a team and my coach made the decision. So that's, that part's not on me. I, I did what I could and they did what they could. But when we're being the, the tip of the spear. And when our coaches are trusting us and giving us the ability to make some of these important decisions. You it, realize that it all reflects back to us and you're just fortunate to have team members who are also willing to have it reflect back onto them. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, well, I think if you're personally invested in it, there's gonna be a better result. If you're actually, if the music resonates with you, if the program resonates with you, if you, know, if you enjoy it, it's gonna obviously be better in the end for you. And Do you have, yeah. And results aside, um, because we aren't in control of the results. That's one of the right. things we understood too. It's like, no matter how this turns out, uh, the placement, the metal color, whatever, um, we would feel this sense of gratitude for having gone through the experience and done it our way. Um, right. Because you aren't in control of the outcome. 
Yeah, well, because it is a judge sport and it's, you know, <laughs> in the end, there's so many, there's, so, there's politics and there's other factors that always go into the decision. So at least you can come out of it with a sense of gratitude that you felt like you did your best. You were happy with it. It's certainly more important than she the said, score, yeah. right? <laughs> no, but you're exactly right, Lisa. That was definitely our approach. And when we finished our performances at the Olympics, that was definitely our happiest moment. Of course, we were so thrilled to have medaled twice and that was very special, but we didn't know if that was gonna happen or not. So to be at the end of our performances and to feel like we fully put everything out there, that was the most rewarding. Yeah, you're put, essentially, as soon as you finish your program, your results are in the hands of people you may or may not know. Uh, and yeah. may or may not know how invested you were in your process or you know like there are all these little elements that factor into just humans judging other humans from you know uh they say don't judge a book by its cover <laughs> it looks very different on the ice to every other cover out there uh and so uh we learned over time through disappointment and frustration um truly the importance of um our process and how in, intensive and involved, but and also you can just was. feel it in the arena too at the Olympics. Being able to create a moment, obviously it's broadcast around the world, which is incredible. But to know that within that stadium, we were able to for four or five minutes kind of take people away and take them on this journey with us was very special. Yeah. So, do you have plans to return to competition? I know a lot of people have been asking because you haven't officially retired. Do you want to continue skating and shows, or are you maybe going to go back for Beijing 2022? Or is there anything yeah. you want to tell us? Um, yeah, it's been. I think since we made our first announcement. Actually, no. Since since we got home. <laughs> Not <laughs> even since we got home, as soon as we got off the ice, right? Well, no, I'm just saying like, since we got home, people have been asking like, when was the next time they could see us skate? Sure. Which, which is, is incredibly flattering, right? Um, and the answer is, well, you know, you may have just found out about us now, but there are <laughs> years of competition footage that you can find on, on YouTube and, and, and stuff like that. Um, I would say that for us, um, the book has been a really nice departure. Uh, we didn't stop skating to write the book. Um, we didn't take a break from competitive skating because Kudo Kits was on sort of our, our bulletin sort of vision board, but having the opportunity to step away. And I guess, how do I, there was a period of time in our skating career where following our first Olympics, we were really trying to figure out how to unlock the key to the success that we had accomplished earlier on. Um, you know, we entered the competitive Olympic scene, so to speak, in 2011. Um, with, 10, 11, yeah. Yeah, with, with a huge splash. Uh, we, we won a medal at our first world championships. That, hasn't, that hadn't been done in over 50 years in the entire modern entire history of the sport being competed at the Olympics. Uh, and I don't think that it will and watch it happen next year. <laughs> I, I don't think that it's very uncommon for that to happen because the field is always so deep. Um, and there is definitely like, you know, you're going from high school to college and you're living on your own. That same sort of comparison can be made to taking a leap from skating as a junior to skating with the, the big teams. Uh, at the senior ranks. And so we surprised everyone, including ourselves a little bit, not necessarily with the quality of our skating, but definitely the results. And there was a period of time where we sort of um, continued to work just as hard, but perhaps expectations were even higher. And we weren't accomplishing the results that we thought were not guaranteed, but were necessary. But we had been shown we were, were foretold or possible. Right. Yeah. And so after our first Olympic Games experience, which was so inspiring, and super motivating uh, and a dream come true. But if we were completely honest from a competitive like spirit perspective, we knew that we could have done better or not that we could have done better, but we the result could have been more. And so like, how can we take this passion that we have for this sport and we still love skating together. Like after every Olympic games, every athlete goes through that question. You know, I just committed so much uh, spirit and energy and passion into this four-year chunk, do I want to do it again for another four years? Mm -hmm. uh, and we made the decision that we did, but we sort of in that first year following the 2014 Olympics, 
we stretched our wings a little bit and we explored new spaces and we spent just as much time on the ice as we were before, but we committed extra time to learning more about other things, uh, watching more movies, uh, which sounds strange. It's like, I'm not, I'm not saying that <laughs> watching movies is the way to improve your skating career, but uh, exploring different points of view from artists in writing in visual art in dance and learning more about what we were drawn to as opposed to just kind of following a formula that had taken us to a certain level, but in order to break through to that next tier uh, that we knew we were capable of, we had to step away in a way. Mm -hmm. And had to develop our point of view. And so to loop back to kind of now, what right? we've been doing, I think what we notice when we're on the ice now is that we are Better. different, yeah, like different, uh, more evolved, more creative, um, able to perform at a new level just because we ourselves have changed and been through certain experiences. So. Yeah. I, I mean, you see it in other sports, for example. I don't know if any of the viewers on, on the Zoom like watch football, for example, and I don't know him personally. I don't know his process and football isn't as creative or artistic a sport as figure skating or ice dance, but some athletes like Tom Brady, uh, get better with age, uh, you know, or manage to maintain a level of performance that is sort of unprecedented. And I think it comes down to sort of life experience, dedication, uh, self-respect, understanding for like what it truly takes and knowing yourself. Understanding um, the mental, physical balance. And so I think to complete what we're saying, it's we're still young and that's <laughs> very fortunate thing about us having success so early is that sure we've had our ups and downs but we're still very young yeah and to learn a lot of those lessons when you're a young person as opposed to when you're more fully formed as an adult is daunting like it, it's it's definitely tough and so much gratitude to the people that helped us sort of figure that out and in the end Maya and I had to depend on each other like we had to figure it out ourselves and come to terms with those lessons that were being learned at very sort of stressful, difficult times at the time uh, that seemed very sort of critical, critical to, uh, to us and in, in our career at that moment. Um, but, but yeah, the, the benefit is so much knowledge about ourselves and uh, I guess a level of mental acuity and perspective that we can now take it's, it's silly to say, I guess, or it sounds silly to say that writing a book is going to make us a better skating team. It definitely has made us better people. Um, and I think if it makes us better people, then it certainly has the opportunity to make us better skaters. And we've been getting out on the ice uh, fairly frequently uh, and over the past year. And it's like Maya said, it's kind of an unspoken thing, but we do recognize um, taking a step away from competition. We've, gain so much than if we were just in the grind on a day-to-day -day right. basis, um, looking at the same spot on the wall in the same way, uh, as opposed to, you know, checking out the different rooms in our house, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, definitely like cross training and world experience, maturity, you know, kind of taking a break, all those things I think are only helpful you know, to you and your skating. So are we going to see maybe more Kudo Kids books? Like where will they travel to next? Uh, will there be a cartoon series, a movie? I mean, have you thought that big at this stage? And then maybe after this, we can start taking some of the audience questions that were submitted. Yeah. I mean, when you first start out as a young athlete in any sport, um, people tell you to think big. Yeah. Uh, and people will say like, oh, like, you know, you be hoisting that that Super Bowl trophy, or you're going to be, you know, winning the World Cup, uh, or going to the Olympics. Tell, Alex is a huge sports fan and is able to reference all the sports in conversation. <laughs> um, and that sounds kind of ridiculous, but with children, young people, we we ins we hope to um, impress upon them the idea of dreaming big and that anything is possible. And, and of course, when you zoom out and you think about sort of what are the odds, right? Like pragmatically, like what are the odds of a young person sort of successfully clearing every hurdle that it takes over the years, right? And their own personal interests kind of evolving and changing and them as a person changing, like that they could end up at the Olympics, the odds are, are slim. 
but they're definitely there. And so with the book, it being a animated television, television series or a, a movie, like it sounds ridiculous to say right now, but it was also ridiculous for us to say that we wanted to go to the Olympics when we were nine and 12. Um, in the grand scheme of things. So I think that would be wonderful because I think that, again, the story and the characters um, have shown themselves to be very inspirational and exciting and compelling, whether kids are picking up on all the lessons or not. You know? <laughs> it's like you watch a really great animated movie and the best ones, I think. Are that- for everyone, have lessons, have heart, have humor. And that's really what we tried to do with these two books. And so we've definitely been taking recommendations from other people on where the Kudo Kids should go next. But one of the things that's been so important to us is also encouraging and have people share with their friends and family that they enjoyed the series, leaving reviews, all those things really help us out. Yeah, because I mean, they're, <laughs> this is a whole separate conversation, but we're so fortunate now to be living at a time where there are so many things to watch and read and uh, things are at like, you know, the click of a button. And so it's all the more important that when you connect with something and you enjoy something that you talk about it and you share it. And whether that's on social media or with your family, that's how, um, I guess on the sort of behind the scenes side, that's how, more stories that are of value to you get told. It's when you say that you value them and then the people then can make them happen. Uh, see that, see that hear that, too. and then see like, oh, well, you know, they're excited. So we should be excited about doing more. Um, and that's how we feel about representation. That's how we feel about uh, storytelling and storytellers from uh, marginalized communities, the AAPI community and otherwise. Um, the more the merrier, but it is critical that, you know, you have that foundation and community support. And we're fortunate to have, to have a lot of that. That's great. So do you want to maybe take some of the questions that were submitted to you in advance? And I see there's also the Q and A box is filling up. If you want to select maybe some of the questions that have been sent in to answer. I like this nerves question. (laughs) Why don't you read it out? My sister gets on my nerves a lot. Do you get on each other's nerves? At first, I I think I misread it at first because I thought it was going to be one of those. The other question that we get related to nerves, different type of nerves, is sort of nerves of nervousness, competing um, and and trying to do your best. But to answer this question first, before we kind of launch into the other interpretation of that, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Her brother gets on her nerves a lot. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> of course. I mean, I feel like that's so natural with sibling dynamics or anyone that you work closely with or spend a lot of time with. It's impossible to always kind of be on each other's best side, kind of, right? Yeah, I mean, that's any relationship, um, you know, work relationships, friendships, they all go through sort of peaks and valleys, highs and lows. Um, but it's important to sort of take the average of all of that. And if it's generally good, the thing that we find special uh, about having a sibling is that you're, you're connected by being family, but that's also shared experience. That means that uh, as sisters, in your case, you have the ability to confide in each other and there's a form of trust that can be developed there. Uh, and if you can come to appreciate that, uh, I think you'll find that there are so many amazing things that you can experience together and share in life, which is super, super special. Um, Okay. Uh, Yankees or Red Sox? I think this is- (laughs) That's a dangerous one. I think I know the answer, but I won't say. Yeah, well, so that's interesting, right? (laughs) Two is, takes place in Manhattan. And I don't think Maya mentioned it, but- I was born Yeah. Yeah, I mentioned it. Oh, you did? Okay, so Maya's a New Yorker. Uh, by birth. And but Alex was born in Boston. Always- Sibling rivalry as well oh, as. Sibling rivalry. <laughs> Sibling rivalry. Yes, that's right? another term. But so when right. we were younger and his personality and mood was so dependent on how the sports teams were doing, I kind of had to root for his team so that he would be in a good mood. But now that we're older, we kind of geared into separate directions we support individuals teams it's like and and things were so much bigger 
for me when I was younger. Like my my entire outlook on life hinged on whether the Red Sox beat the Yankees. <laughs> it was, it was um, in retrospect, Dramatic, a very unbalanced yeah. way to go about living my life. Um, but that's how passionate I was about sports and stories. And I think there was something for the people who do follow baseball was very compelling to me. And maybe I, I'm kind of connecting dots sort of as I speak right now, but this sort of down on their luck team that hadn't won for years and years and years and generations of families sort of going to the ballpark and like hoping that this year was the year and it wasn't the year for them. Maya and I, our skating career hadn't even started out. Um, but I thought that there was something really special about that story, um, about the underdog. And obviously times have changed. The Red Sox have won some World Series. And of course, the Yankees have won theirs. But at that time, when I was being introduced to sort of America's pastime, the sport of baseball, I found it uh, heartwarming and kind of sad. <laughs> that here, no matter what, though, like there was this sort of enthusiasm and faith that like this year is the year this year is the year that we're going to do it and that kind of uh go, the power of hope right? yeah that go get it um perseverance and optimism uh was inspiring and that's something that i think i did take from my fandom of sports into our career as athletes you have to maintain that sense of optimism and hope even when times are tough and that's in sports that's that's it's, a, it's most important that you believe in yourself i mean because there can be detractors and people who have different opinions of you but as curses long, history as all of it you have that core belief that's what we're really pushing through yeah okay What's next one? uh you have such what, what is that you have such you have had such extraordinary careers, careers already. What does life take you now? Where does life take you now? Um, that kind of touches on some of the stuff that we've already talked about. Yeah, you didn't totally answer, but yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> we're leaving it. We're leaving the future open. Well, you know, <laughs> uh, I, I would say that uh, we've known for a long time since we were pretty young. Just you become a student of the sport and you realize that uh, Michelle Kwan isn't competing anymore, or Scott Hamilton isn't competing anymore, but they still seem like pretty young to you, you know? Um, competitive skating, there is like a, there's a span of your career. Sure. Uh, where you don't see any 40 year olds out there um, competing at the Olympics. And that's, that's for a reason. The sport is very demanding physically. Uh, so hopefully, you know, long lives ahead of us, we have interests and passions in storytelling. So whether it's books um, or other mediums, we love being creative and that's one of the gifts that skating has given us. And there are some projects that we can't fully talk about yet, but that we are working on, which is exciting, not to be too much of a tease, but we've learned so much through working on these first two books and we're excited to continue growing and learning and sharing because that's what we're really passionate about. Yeah, creating so things that can be enjoyed and um, especially for the next generation, uh, because I think that when you tell a story to the next generation, you have the opportunity to reach them, their parents, the people that influence them uh, and surround them. Uh, I think that's how sport can be a really positive uh, influence on people's lives, but also a, a really good story. Because I mentioned it earlier, but that moment that we shared at the Olympics with our performance, we've felt that same feeling when we see people reading our books or sharing photos because we didn't have the traditional book tour rollout because of the, the pandemic but then to hear the feedback or hear that young kids can't stop what they're eating just because they want to keep reading the book that's amazing because i remember being so taken with stories when i was a kid so to know that all of our hard work in creating this series is impacting a young person's life is very amazing and special we'll go a little faster um to be to be conscious of the time um, yeah, what's your you favorite? want to take one last question, maybe, yeah. End it with food. We right? can end it with two quick ones, right? Okay, okay. Um, what's your favorite Japanese food? Can't pick, but my um, comfort food is agadashi tofu. Okay. Ooh. Yeah. People laugh at me when I say that, but it's true. Yeah, I don't know why. Japanese people always think that's funny. I don't know if it's because they anticipate more of like an entree type meal but i've just loved it since i was a kid yeah it's like home style yeah. uh, i love I'm vegetarian tonkatsu. so i pick that too what do you like yeah. tonkatsu okay <laughs> yeah, not not vegetarian 
Um, but uh, yeah, okay. So then the, the last one that I wanted to answer, uh, who's uh, the most exciting figure skater to you right now on the world stage? I would have to say that since we were, he's developed a lot of, and obviously he's probably like, if not the greatest of all time, the greatest of all time, I would say Yuzu um, is always exciting. Uh, yeah. And he brings so much sort of intensity uh, to, to his performances that uh, it can be fun being a, a friend slash colleague of his because we know him off the ice and he's very easygoing. And, but when he puts his game face on uh, and- He has it, whatever that it factor is, he can. Yeah, yeah. and, and it, it, it sort of, uh, tr it transcends countries uh, and languages. And, and again, that's the power of a great storyteller um, someone who can capture your attention and draw you in. So I, I would have to say yeah, something. well, he's definitely all in in terms of artistry and technical, which is pretty rare, you know, to get that complete package. And he's so and focused. I, and I think as an, from a sports perspective, it's interesting because um, whether he, he skates cleanly or not, I always enjoy the performance. I always enjoy the experience of, of watching him because I know that he's just like giving everything he's got. Uh, and he, he doesn't quit on his performances. He like, uh, he's like a warrior out there really. Yeah. And like, we've seen it throughout the span of, we started competing with him, um, not a with him, but ago. yeah, we, we met him in Croatia, uh, in 2008. It was, I think one of his first international competitions and one of our first international competitions. And we've been very fortunate. To skating kind of has grow up together yeah yeah definitely yeah. um to meet people not only from japan but you know around the world and sort of go on this amazing incredible ride thank you both so much for joining us looks like we are at the hour point so apologies to anyone who didn't get their question answered and i want to let everyone know that the books are available for purchase on our website and we're going to keep that window open until wednesday so everyone has a chance to get their autographed copies of the books, which at a discounted price, uh, thanks to Barnes and Noble. So get your books and um, thank you so much, Maya and Alex. I don't know if you wanna have, have any closing remarks before we wrap up the program. Uh, just thank you really. Thank you for spending this time with us today. Thank you, Lisa, for being our moderator and host. We were so happy to do this with Japan Society and Really appreciate everyone's time and support of not just us, but also our book series. Yeah, uh, I second everything that Maya said. She said it so well, I don't have anything else to say. But uh, <laughs> yeah, if you have the opportunity to to read Kudo Kids, uh, you can, you know, like like Lisa said, you can get it at the discounted rate. Uh, and if you've already read it, share it with a friend uh, who you think might enjoy it. We would really appreciate that. Yeah, thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, I also wanted to thank Anna Elling, who's on the call from Penguin Random House, Young Readers, um, and just thanks to everyone who helped organize this event. It was like, honestly, as a big skating fan, it was a, a real pleasure to have you. And uh, uh, hopefully we will be seeing you again in a future Japan Society program. We have a couple of programs still coming up um, for the Passing the Torch series as we head into the Olympic games, which start on July 23rd. We have um, another skating event featuring skaters from the US and Japan. Um, the panel will be moderated by Nancy Kerrigan and will feature Mirai Nagasu, Satoko Miyahara, Yuka Sato, and Nikki Ando. Uh, so we hope you'll join us. That's a free program coming up on Tuesday, June 29th at 8 p.m. EDT. Uh, you can join us from Japan at 9 a.m. JST on Wednesday, June 30th. And then moving into July, uh, during the All-Star break, no one has any excuses for not attending our baseball panel, which is the night after the All-Star game. Uh, Let's Play 2, Baseball in Japan and the U.S. is on Wednesday, July 14th at 8 p.m. EDT, which is Thursday, July 15th at 9 a.m. JST. So please join us from Japan. These are both free events, and we're really excited to be able to present our favorite sports uh, to the public and hopefully some new audiences will join as well. We look forward to seeing you again. I hope everyone has a great rest of the weekend. Thanks for joining us today. And thank you again, Maya and Alex.